from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Tyne Morgan. Well, it's a first for us. The first time we are visiting the Jackrabbits. That's right. We're at South Dakota State University this weekend for our U.S. Farm Report Beck's College Roadshow. And here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Harvest is in full swing and USDA isn't finished adjusting yields or demand. The effect of that was obviously productions uh, reduced, but at the same time they reduced exports. What USDA's report released just this week hints at down the road. Turning soybean oil into products consumers use every day. That's what this, this facility is, is uh, designed to do, is to take an idea from a scientific lab and get it ready to uh, gain the confidence of investors. A sneak peek of a brand new center that will now bring bioproducts to life. Putting pork production on a pedestal. There's a lot of uh, different thoughts out there of why this is bad, but we are showing them why it's good. How SDSU bucked the trend in helping pork producers across the state grow. And an ice cream invention that happened right here at South Dakota State more than 50 years ago. It became cookies and cream and very quickly it really became very, very popular. Decades later, it still has fans coming back for more. The 2023 U.S. Farm Report College Roadshow from South Dakota State University is brought to you exclusively by Bex. From farmers' first pass in the field to the final one at harvest, it's a game plan rooted in faith and belief. Bex Hybrids is with you every turn because both on and off the field, we're all farmers at heart. See why at BexHybrids.com. Now for the news, USDA releasing its latest crop production forecast on Thursday. Officials surveyed about 8,000 farmers to get the latest look at harvest. USDA now estimating a corn yield of 173 bushels per acre, cutting production down 70 million bushels from last month. Soybeans that yield at 49.6 bushels per acre, down half a bushel from the September forecast, cutting production by 42 million bushels. Now checking ending stocks, corn coming in 110 million bushels lower to 2.1 billion bushels. USDA also making a 25 million bushel cut to exports. Soybean exports are also reduced, but ending stocks are unchanged from last month at 220 million bushels. For wheat, ending stocks are up 55 million bushels to 670 million. We'll take a deeper dive into those numbers coming up in our roundtable. And a quick check on harvest shows that it's really picking up pace right now. In its latest crop progress report, USDA says 34% of the corn crop has been harvested. That's three points ahead of the five-year average. And when it comes to soybeans, a big leap. Now 43% is harvested. That's up 20 points from last week alone and six points ahead of average. Well, harvest is moving ahead of average right here in South Dakota, as we found out this week in our I-80 harvest tour. Corn harvest is nearly a quarter of the way done and five points ahead of normal, with 48% of the soybeans harvested, also four points ahead of average. Yields have been mostly disappointing on soybeans, but farmers say it's better than expected on corn, especially considering the state faced another year of drought. Last year we had record yields. The weather was just perfect for our area. We were in the 70s and, and so far we're in the 50s, so it's it's about 20 bushel difference. Either side of 200 is going to catch a lot. I, I, I hope to be able to put a two in front of the average, but a lot of, lot of acres to go over yet to get there. Now growers say statewide yields in South Dakota will likely be lower than the five year average for both corn and soybeans, but still above last year when drought was even more widespread across the state. Well, the conflict in Israel this week shocking the market on Monday before things settled back and now it's finding its way into global potash markets. The battle disrupting operations at Israel's port. It's a major hub for Israel's potash exports, which make up about 3% of global supplies. Fertilizer makers across the world seeing an uptick in stock prices following this past weekend's surprise attack by Hamas. The stock price for Nutrien climbing 4% with Mosaic and CF Industries up 6%. Analysts from Scotiabank adding that if Iran, a significant nitrogen exporter, gets involved, it could cause supply issues in some regions. Smithfield says it's closing a pork processing plant in Charlotte, North Carolina. 
It says it plans to transfer production to its Tar Heel facility in the state. The company says the closure will mean increased efficiency and better use of existing capacity. And Smithfield says it will provide financial and other assistance to the 107 employees impacted by the closure. Now, some may be transferred to other locations, but the final production day at the Charlotte plant is scheduled for December. Meanwhile, a big announcement from America's largest retail store, Walmart. Walmart says it plans to build another of its own milk processing plants. The $350 million facility is planned for Valdosta, Georgia. Officials say they will use ingredients sourced from local farmers. The company says the new plant will provide milk to more than 750 Walmart and Sam's Club stores in Georgia, along with neighboring states. Walmart's vice president of manufacturing saying the company wants to do more to ensure its milk supply. The new Georgia location is scheduled to begin operation in late 2025 and could employ up to 400 people. All right, that's it for the news. Well, some beautiful fall weather. Much of the week in Brookings before it turned off cold and wet, putting a pause on harvest here. So what about the rest of October? How's the weather shaping up? We'll have a check of your weather coming up next. The I-80 Harvest Tour on U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Case IH. The Farm All has been an iconic partner on the farm for generations. Come celebrate a century of Farm All. The one for all with us at farmall100.com and by AGI. At AGI, we spend a lot of time focused on product details, making sure you can store your grain how you need to and move it when you need to. Learn more at aggrowth.com. U.S. Farm Report weather is brought to you by H&S Manufacturing. The 3100 and 3200 series heavy-duty manure spreaders are available in 235 to 430 bushel models and feature a standard two-speed apron drive. Find out more at the H&S website. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Engelbrecht. Matt, we've been talking about this unseasonably warm weather for our road show this year, including here in South Dakota up until this week. But I feel like we talk about these Indian summers every year. So can we just start calling these September and early October warm temperatures or new normal fall weather? Or is this year really an anomaly? Well, Tyne, how much time do you got? Because it would take a lot longer than three minutes to answer that question. The, the short answer is uh, what we're seeing now uh, regarding uh, climate change and what's going on with our seasons. Uh, the overnight lows, our morning temperatures are the ones that are kind of setting the records that we're seeing uh, temperatures warmer in the morning more so than our high temperatures in the afternoon. So if you want to look at exactly how these seasons are changing or shifting, you want to start with your morning temperatures. We're not getting as cold as soon, and that's what's kind of lingering uh, the uh, seasons a little bit longer uh, than before. Hopefully that helps answer that question. Now, obviously there's a lot more to it, but I just wanted to start off with that. Now we look at the forecast going ahead uh, for uh, this week. Precipitation outlook after a very wet weekend. Uh, going back to Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday uh, through the Midwest. A ridge of high pressure is going to try to build and dry things out. I'm not expecting the heat to come with it, but this ridge should help quiet things down a little bit and hopefully they get the farmers back out in the fields if it is still rather muddy. On the west coast, a ridge of high pressure will start to build, but that is not going to last the entire week. In fact, our next piece of energy is going to start to move in. Until that happens, expect the heat to build off in the uh, not only the Pacific Northwest back down here toward the west, but expanding uh, to the east as well. The possibility is there, Illinois and Wisconsin, for slightly above normal temperatures between October 17th and October 21st. So what does this look like regarding the jet stream as you go through the rest of the week? Uh, there's that uh, troublesome low pressure system uh, that uh, came through. We've had two straight weekends where this has uh, been showing up in the jet stream and producing widespread showers and uh, cold, damp conditions across the United States. That continues to linger into our Monday and Tuesday and amplify or uh, push up this ridge out here to the west. So we got lines dipping down well to the south here and then up to the north there. There's where that warmth starts to come into play as that low leaves a little bit of a broad ridge that builds in. So remember that a below average or slightly drier conditions. Well, that's going to be Tuesday and Wednesday into the Midwest. A little bit wetter with this trough coming in and across the Dakotas. There's a look at the jet stream Wednesday, Thursday, and also into your Friday.
Thanks, Matt. Well, USDA's latest crop report meant more adjustments to crop production and demand. We have a group of economists from right here at South Dakota State ready to digest the numbers and talk about what impact it could have in the months ahead. That happens next. Well, welcome back to U.S. Farm Report, SDSU this weekend, Hobo Day. We are excited to be here. School spirit is really at a level 10 this week, and we're excited to showcase that. A great group here from South Dakota State University just to talk about the latest that's happening in agriculture, including a big USDA report this week. October report was out on Thursday. This thought that, you know, some thought we would see a, a cut in yield. Some thought we maybe see soybean yield go up a little bit. But at the end of the day, what did we see USDA do? So in the October report, USDA uh, lowered corn yields from 173.8 to 173. Um, the effect of that was obviously productions uh, reduced, but at the same time they reduced exports um, and they reduced uh, some other aspects of, of demand. And so all in all, even though production was decreased quite a bit, the ending stocks level was only decreased 100 million bushels. And so we're still looking at that 15% stocks to use ratio which would suggest prices would be pretty much where they're trading right now around that 480, maybe $5 mark. So you don't think we're going to see much movement when it comes to corn and bean prices specifically? Uh, to corn prices, no. And, and the bean uh, yield so was reduced as well. Um, and then they did some different things with the demand side on that in order to keep um, the stocks to use level basically the same there. Um, and so prices for soybeans would generally maybe try to stick around that $12.50, $13 dollar mark, but we might see possibilities of $14 core or soybeans uh, in the future if we could see demand pick up in some other aspects and we could reduce that 220 million inning stocks down to below that into the 100 million area of stocks, inning stocks uh, available for next year. Well, you go back to this summer. The weather was less than ideal. I mean, we have been impressed with some of these yields this year, despite all of the challenges that we saw from Mother Nature. But, Sarah, when you look at the big picture of things, does higher yield actually equate to higher returns for farmers? Um, that's a great question and, and something I've been working on throughout my dissertation research. And especially now that I'm um, an assistant professor, I've we've been working on a project with nitrogen management uh, challenging farmers to think more about this. So I just finished my PhD at the University of Illinois. And during that time, I was involved in a project uh, with my advisor, Dr. Gary Schnitke, the Illinois Corn Growers and the Illinois Soybean Association. And what we found was that um, farmers who were following the university, nitro who were applying nitrogen above the university nitrogen recommendation may have been having higher yields, yes, but they were not necessarily having higher returns than those who were, who were applying at the university nitrogen recommendation. So I think um, shifting that mindset, thinking about profit maximization versus yield maximization is, is very important for farmers. Well, that's a mindset shift that we're going to have to see, especially as we look at higher interest rates. And Joe, when you look at this week, some you know discussions from the Fed, are we going to see another interest rate hike? What's your thoughts at this point? Yeah. Um, so the Fed's primary goal is to get inflation back to 2%. And that's not where it is. As of Thursday morning, uh, we learned that the consumer price index remained somewhat elevated. Their goal is 2%, and we're working between 3.7 and 4%, depending on how you measure it. So the only tool the Federal Reserve really has to combat this higher inflation is to raise interest rates. Um, and they've been doing so, as everyone knows, very aggressively. But not only have they been increasing interest rates, but the market has been increasing interest rates. So bond yields has, have been rising as well. Um, and in some ways, I think the attention on the Fed as to whether or not they will raise again is somewhat misplaced. The bond markets are bigger and the bond markets are determining all on their own that interest rates need to be higher. So I think that path or that trend is going to continue. And we can talk more about this, but I'm in the camp of higher for longer. And it seems like that is what we're going to see. So what are some of those impacts if we do have these higher for longer interest rates? Yeah. So what the central bank is fundamentally doing is controlling demand. The central bank can't create uh, increases in productivity or do anything to the supply side of the economy. All they have is this interest rate lever. And when they raise that interest rate, they are changing the math, if you will, on investment opportunities, on consumption opportunities, and raising those rates reduces uh, the the uh, 
the tendency for firms to invest, uh, for consumers to purchase, and so on. So it will slow economic activity. And that's what everyone is really now thinking about. At what point do these increases in interest rates, these sustained increases in interest rates, actually work to slow labor markets and economic activity more generally? And that's an old question. Well, we need to talk a little bit more about demand when it comes to soybeans, renewable diesel. We'll get in that discussion, cover crops. We have a lot more to talk about. But first, we need to take a quick break, and then we'll be back with much more U.S. Farm Report. The push to go solar. That's John's world this weekend. I have spoken maybe a little too often about the unwarranted concern over minuscule farmland loss to our solar arrays until I realized it really wasn't about the land. It was about changing how we get power and our electricity. Far more solar panels are being installed somewhere other than cornfields. Numbers for rooftop solar, for example, for example, surprised many experts in the last year. The resistance to renewable energy, though, is increasing, which is typical for disruptive technologies once they gain too much momentum to be dismissed outright. Solar energy is ever more strongly linked to electric vehicles as well, which compounds the unease many feel about the future. Nonetheless, there are efforts to mitigate this non-existent farmland loss problem. One of these is called agrivoltaics, combining agriculture with solar installations. Now, this e effort strikes me as more curiosity than breakthrough, though. One common solution to farmland installations is grazing underneath the panel. The combination works for pastured sheep and cattle especially, although I would never underestimate the ability of a cow to rub any post loose. As extreme heat becomes more common, the shade becomes more valuable for pastured livestock. Another mixture of solar and ag that caught my attention was this intercropping experiment. The first thing I noticed were the solar panels were fixed vertically, which would drastically lower the electrical output, at least, at least at my latitude anyway. But this photo is from Alberta, Canada, where the sun always hits at a much lower angle, and that decreases the efficiency loss enough to make something like this idea a little less unthinkable. Still, as an older farmer whose ability to operate a million dollar combine safely in huge open fields, and that's a discussion of our continuing discussion on our farm, the idea of driving accurately between expensive solar arrays, even with amazing electronic assistance, is something I think better left to Canadians, perhaps. John, I have a lot of questions after seeing those photos. Wow. Well, when we come back, an award-winning tractor team. How did they pull it off? That's Tractor Tales next. Each year, the International Quarter Scale Tractor Student Design Competition draws college students from across the country. And for South Dakota State, they've seen huge success, as you'll see with Rabbit Force One this weekend. The American Society of Agriculture and Biological Engineers puts on a quarter scale student design competition for university teams. We have won the championship in 2023, 2022, and 2018. Well, we start off in the fall semester with ideas. From there, we start ordering parts and designing the tractor. And moving into the spring semester, we start building the tractor. We write reports on it during the spring semester, and then in the first week in June, we travel down to Peoria, Illinois to compete in a competition with the other teams. That competition consists of team presentation, a design judging session, and performance events like a tractor pull and a durability event. This is RF1, it stands for Rabbit Force One. It's a lot of long hours. Uh, we spend a lot of time researching parts that we want to include on the tractor. Um, we spend a lot of time modeling in SolidWorks. 
and then uh, sp spent a lot of time wrenching in the shop too to put the tractor together. So this tractor is fully drive-by wire with the electric steering. Uh, we shift our manual transmission with electric actuators. We've got a custom PCB on the tractor for all our controllers. Oh, it's fabulous to drive it around and show off to people. Back-to-back -back champions, congratulations. Well, up next, revving up demand for things like soybean oil, but in a unique way, and it could open up a field of opportunity. We'll tell you how next. And later, I hope your taste buds are ready for this one because we are visiting the birthplace of cookies and cream ice cream. That's right, that's happening this weekend on our College Road Show. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, exciting things are happening right here at South Dakota State University. Just this week, the university held the grand opening for the Poet Bioproduct Center, a lab that will bring products made from things like soybean oil to life. It will bring researchers from South Dakota State University and South Dakota School of Mines together with other partners from across the industry to transition bench scale bioprocessing and bioproducts research into real products to be used around the globe. That's what this, this facility is, is uh, designed to do, is to take an idea from a scientific lab and get it ready to uh, gain the confidence of investors so that they'll um, like what's called commercialize it into a product that all of us can use. This one is specifically dedicated to bioproducts and to taking plant-based materials uh, and turning them into valuable goods that we can use uh, in our daily lives. And so that's pretty exciting. Well, some of that research is already underway here at South Dakota State and it's creating fields of opportunity as Farm Journal's Michelle Rook returned to her alma mater here at South Dakota State to give us a sneak peek. Researchers here at South Dakota State University are developing the next generation of bioproducts that will replace petroleum-based products and provide functional solutions. Current project we are working on is adding value to the soybean, soybean oil. The three-year study is being funded in part by the South Dakota Soybean Checkoff to convert this renewable soy-based feedstock into an epoxy that can replace petroleum-based resins. What we are trying to do here is developing a novel, renewable, thermoset bioresin from soybean oil. Dr. Muthu says soybean oil has unique properties which make it a good thermoset resin, which can withstand high heat of 600 to 700 degrees Celsius. These bioresins will not melt in the high temperatures. They will have the same structure, so application is very, very unique, and it has a high value. In fact, these soy-based bioresins can be used in various products consumers use every day. Any medical applications where they have sterilization process, um, automobiles, um, aeroplanes. Maggie Hoff is a senior agriculture and biosystems engineering major at SDSU and has been working on the project for the last year. I've been involved in mostly the actual lab scale testing of it and running different experiments and making, um, making the actual resin. Hoff says she's excited to work on a greener, renewable alternative to plastics and other product materials that are in high demand by consumers. We only have so much petroleum and other uh, products like that that are like fossil fuels, I guess, that we are going to run out someday. It won't be soon necessarily, but we need to start working on a solution before we run out. Long before the push for sustainable products, South Dakota farmers like David Iverson were looking for new uses for soybean oil beyond cooking oil because it's low value anchored soybean prices. But today with the push for green products and fuels like renewable diesel, the script has flipped. That long ago there was an abundance of soybean oil and now right now the soybean oil is what's driving the demand in the crushing market that uh, there's so much demand for it. Iverson was on the state soybean checkoff board when they first funded research on biodiesel and soybean oil-based products. Today, he's back on the board to witness the evolution. Companies want to have a, a green portfolio and to be sustainable. And so in agriculture, if we can help provide the opportunities for, for companies to, to meet their goals, and uh, benefit us as well, it, uh, it's great for the whole country. Many soybean-based products have already been commercialized like BioTurf and PoreShield, which extends the life of roads. 
but Muthu says they've just scratched the surface when it comes to agriculture providing green economical solutions. I think bioproducts is a new space where there's a lot of opportunities available. As long as like our product is um, an equal, a fairly equal like competitor to the petroleum-based product, if it can be replaced, that we should do that as much as possible. That's because it ultimately improves demand and the price for crops grown in the state and region. A lot of those products are either from agriculture, if it's uh, corn, soybeans, wheat stubble, just anything used in agriculture. If we can add value to any part of, of the plant or the, the residue or any part of that, that will be a benefit. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle, and she'll rejoin us in just a bit. But first, geopolitical tensions are growing around the globe. Could it continue to shake up the world of ag trade? We'll talk about it with our panel of SDSU economists coming up next. Well, welcome back to our discussion from here at the Raven Precision Agricultural Center, a great space moving indoors since it got a little cool and, and, and rainy outside. When you look at some of the demand changes that we saw in USDA's report looking at exports, but here domestically, there's a lot of excitement when it comes to renewable diesel. Have we seen renewable diesel pick up and that demand come on slower than what was expected? Yeah, well, I think so, at least according to the uh, USDA reports and, and the crush reports that have been coming out in the latest couple of monthly reports. I mean, yeah, we are seeing, seeing a trend of increasing crush uh, domestically for soybeans for the renewable diesel market. Um, but we, you know, there's this expectation that we're going to potentially see another 700,000 bushels per day of crush capacity in the U.S. And if that materializes, um, we can certainly see uh, crush in the United States, uh, you know, be maybe above 3 billion bushels. Um, and right now we're still around 2,300 uh, or 2.3 billion bushels, according to the USDA. So if we see that higher crush in domestic demand for that renewable diesel market, that's certainly going to put pressure up on prices and demand and, and bring down that stocks to use level to very tight levels. Do you think that's realistic for the 2024 growing season? It, it really depends on how, if these expansion projects are on time, when they can get those beans, if they can source them, if they can get the work staff and everything in line to start crushing those later in this uh, year, then I think that that's potentially a possibility. Well, we've been talking about, Sarah, some of the cover crops that may be able to be used in some of these renewable diesel facilities um, and, and looking at that as a potential crop. But when you look at cover crops, are we seeing some of those conservation practices enter into the discussion of, of the farm bill? Yes, there's been um, unprecedented level of uh, federal spending on some of these programs. So we saw the the Inflation Reduction Act with allocations for cover crops. We saw um, some pandemic spending directed towards crop insurance programs, uh, funding cover crop planting. And we've also seen um, the Climate Smart Commodities Program, which is a, a huge level of spending to support not only cover crops, but other agriculture practices that sequester greenhouse gases. So um, there's a lot of opportunities for farmers, but uh, there's also, we need more opportunities. So part of my research we're working on, on designing a policy program to support cover crop adoption at the farm level, because when we look at the literature, um, the proof of the, the yield and economic benefits long-term for cover crops is just not there yet. When we look at cover crops widespread across the U.S. as a, as a general policy. So working to think about that and assist farmers through those challenging first few years of adoption to reaching those more profitable levels with cover crops. Joe, talking about challenges, when you look at the economy, I mean, there was this thought that we were going to see, we've talked about a recession now for what, two years and that it's imminent, it's coming. We haven't really seen that 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 take hold. Have you been impressed with the U.S. economy? Um, that's one way to think about it, right? So output, as we measure it, is above what we think of as potential. Kind of think about a counterfactual, where we would be if all was right with the world. And our output is slightly above that. As we all know, labor markets are very tight. So the economy seems to be defying this higher interest rate environment. There's a somewhat more contrarian view here, though, I think we might um, consider. And that is maybe interest rates aren't high enough and they haven't been high enough for long enough. So 
you know, we can think the economy is sort of beating back the higher interest rate environment, or we can consider the fact that maybe the central bank and bond markets in general have more to do. Um, because again, interest rates, I, I think we have to be very careful when we look back five or six or seven or any number of years before 2008 and treat that period as normal because nothing has been normal since 2008. And so there was a much higher interest rate environment before that. And I would offer the proposition, perhaps somewhat uh, unpopular proposition, that maybe a higher for longer interest rate environment is what we will ultimately see. In that environment, I think economic activity may be suppressed at some point, but we might not be at the point of suppression. Well, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. All right, we need to take another quick break, and then we'll have much more from U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Well, we've seen plenty of headlines this year about poor margins and some pork producers being forced to leave the business. But as Michelle Rook reports here in South Dakota, they're seeing just the opposite. So how are they bucking the trend? Well, she traveled to South Dakota State University to find out. Grain and livestock producers in the upper Midwest are working to expand livestock production. And here at SDSU, they're demystifying pork production to help in that effort. South Dakota and neighboring states have seen steady growth in pork production in the last decade due to a business-friendly climate. We have excess grain, excess soybean meal, we got land, we need to have jobs, right? And so if you look at the swine industry, that was a great place for it. But he says that doesn't mean the public doesn't have concerns and questions. What does the manure do to the water? What is, how bad is the odor going to be? What's going to be truck traffic? Is it, are you humanely treating those animals? So in 2016, SDSU built a new swine facility, and one of the goals was to demystify pork production through transparency. Due to biosecurity reasons, we don't want to have people come into our barns uh, for the risk of bringing disease in. And so what we've done, we've designed the barn so we can bring people in from the outside without them having to shower in. We open the doors, they can see everything that we have. During COVID, they also started doing virtual tours. Senior animal science major Callista Roars is one of the students that lead Zoom tours as part of Operation Main Street. We talked about the different farrowing stalls, the feed system that we have, because we have a really fancy technical feed system that we have used for research and just basic care. And then um, let them see the piglets. Everyone loves seeing those piglets. So it was a good opportunity to share with people that don't really have any knowledge about the swine industry. Through the tours, the public can see firsthand modern pork production practices. The main takeaway is just that we are doing it uh, most humane as possible. Tyler says the other goal is to educate zoning boards and county commissions about what's involved in a concentrated animal feeding operation. And so when they are making that decision whether or not to approve a request to put up a barn, they've got real information, they got science-based information. Growing the livestock industry in the region is important with the increased soybean processing capacity. Plants are crushing for soybean oil for renewable fuels, which will leave a surplus of meal. The animal industry is our biggest consumer of soybean meal, and we really need them more than ever now because oil is in demand. And Tyler says through the promotion of livestock growth, it also provides an avenue for the next generation to get into farming. I'm Michelle Rook for U.S. Farm Report. Thanks, Michelle. Well, utilizing some livestock manure as fertilizer is nothing new, but what about wastewater fertilizer? That's next. Is sewer sludge safe for fertilizer? Well, there are some university researchers at land grants working on ways to mask the smell of odors that come from things like livestock farms. But for one Tennessee viewer, one smell, not from livestock, is creating quite the stir. We have an interesting question from Paul Bowman in Decatur, Tennessee. What is your opinion on the fertilizer made from a wastewater treatment plant here in Tennessee? Several farmers have used it, and, sm and the smell lingers around a lot longer than what they say. I know it's cheaper, but is it safe? What would you suggest or recommend on how to protect our backyard flock from any new disease? Well, wastewater solids or sewer sludge 
are closely monitored by the EPA and the cities themselves constantly and are considered safe to be used as fertilizer. It is extremely unlikely to present a disease threat to your animals either. Oddly, some of the contaminants that are a recent area of investigation are pharmaceuticals, from acetaminophen to opioids. Now, about 40% of biosolids are disposed of as ag fertilizer, and we're continuing to examine whether a slow buildup of such trace contaminants in soil is a long-term problem. Strict rules about runoff and stringent testing have not shown significant dangers. This ag disposal method, though, is usually more about how our brain works than whether sewer sludge is hazardous to human health. Humans evolved to depend largely on sight to experience and manage in the world. Our sense of smell is, well, crude compared to many other mammals. Nevertheless, Odors have a powerful impact on brain reactions and emotions. One of those emotional reactions is called pathological disgust response. It is largely involuntary, which is why one child vomiting in a classroom can trigger others simply from the smell. We don't have any choice about what types of odors cause this response. It's hardwired into our brain to protect us from contamination. At the same time, our sense of smell can acclimate through what's called olfactory fatigue, where the brain responds less the longer the odor is present. Many agricultural smells fall into this category. Hog farms, silage, machinery odors, and smoke are examples. We even become desensitized to body odors from those around us, or persistent smells in our home, such as seasonings like curry or strong cheeses. It's little comfort for me to say, you'll get used to it, but we are built to adjust that way. However, the instinctive link that things that smell bad are harmful cannot be easily overcome with logic and lab results. Thanks, John. Well, that conversation may not have been so appetizing, but after the break, we're about to tap into your taste buds. It's a find that happened here at SDSU more than 50 years ago, and it changed ice cream as we know it today. We'll tell you how next. U.S. Farm Report is brought to you by Brandt, technology-driven nutrition that feeds your crop. Well, to end the show this weekend, we're talking about one of my favorite topics, ice cream. Did you know South Dakota State University is actually the birthplace of cookies and cream ice cream? It's a discovery that happened more than 50 years ago here on campus, and today the claim to fame is one that keeps fans coming back for more. Walk through these doors at South Dakota State and step into an ice cream lover's dream. What you're standing in right now is the Davis Dairy Plant. It was opened in October of 2011. And the dairy plant itself, the dairy store, the dairy program goes back about, I don't know, 135 or so years. Behind these walls is still a fully operational dairy plant. And these windows give a glimpse into the hands-on learning these students get every day. What we want to showcase is the dairy program here at South Dakota State University. What we do here is do, do teaching and research in dairy all the way from the farm to products. And it truly is farm to fork. The milk used here comes from SDSU's dairy cows, then it's processed here and turned into the yummy products you see. And the students are being trained in dairy science, in uh, learning how to make different products. And the science has been going strong for more than 130 years, but it was nearly 50 years ago that a popular ice cream flavor was born. It was like a lot of, like a lot of inventions, you know, it just came about. Shirley sees the plant manager at the time told two students that he had an idea. He said, boys, go get some Oreos, Oreo cookies from the store and and crush them up and put, put them in ice cream. Let's see what happens. Turned out to be okay. It became cookies and cream and very quickly it really became very, very popular. Mystery says ice cream may look like a very innocent product, but the reality is the science of it is extremely complex. There are air bubbles in it. There's a method in which air bubbles are created, but when you create the air bubbles, they have to be stable. 
so that when it, you put the ice cream in the mouth, it will gently melt. It has to be frozen at the right temperature, at the right rate. The ice crystals have to be a certain size, otherwise in the ice cream world it's called sandiness because the ice cream tastes very gritty. Tapping into the science while also uncovering new flavors for others to enjoy. It's how the dairy and food science program here at SDSU serves up a student experience that's truly unique. By the way, job placement upon graduation for the dairy and food science program is 100%. Just amazing. On that note, we may just have to get some ice cream to celebrate another great road show this weekend. A big thank you to everyone here at South Dakota State. They've been so gracious and what a fun week it's been. Next week, we're off to Kansas State University for our next road show stop from make, helping make sorghum a sought after crop around the globe to a purple combine that's a staple at K-State tailgates now. We hope that you'll join us next week for a K-State College Roadshow as we work to build on our tradition. Have a great weekend, everyone. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.